Well, I would like to call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call wise, um, I have Sheila Conroy, Jack. Uh, Julie Hauser is our guest uh, again today, and I welcome you, Julie. Uh, Sarah Prudence, Art Susan, Michelle Wade, Michelle Frieda, and Marcia Martin. Um, it is my understanding that uh, we are not being live streamed today, so there should not be any call-ins. Um, the public is now invited to be heard. Julie, do you have anything that you would like to share with us today? No, thank you. Again, I'm just here to hear what's going on and be up to date. Thanks so much oh. for, for hosting me all the time. Well, we're very happy to have you and thank you. Um, has everyone had the opportunity to review the minutes from the last meeting? Yes. And are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? I move that we accept them as written. Do I hear a second? I, I second. I'm sorry, who made that motion? Susan. So the motion was made by Susan and Michelle Krieger. Second. Thank you. Old business, um, board membership. Michelle, are you updating us on that? I am, am and I'm hoping to get an email uh, at some point this morning. Um, the last I talked to Michelle Gomez in the city clerk's office, we had one application and that was Sheila Conroy. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I had one um, inquiry, but that person lived in Lyons. And so uh, that person's not eligible to apply for this board. Um, we have uh, three positions. Um, two, one of them is term limited and that's Jack. So Jack is not eligible to reapply. Um, and then Michelle Kriegut and Sarah Berry are both eligible to reapply. And um, if you get our weekly email newsletter, you know that we put in a blurb last uh, Friday about both the Friends Board and this uh, advisory board have openings. Only this board has the deadline of this Friday at five o'clock. So um, I will try and keep an eye on my email to see if I hear from the city uh, clerk city manager's office about any updates, but perhaps Sarah or, or Michelle or Sheila or others may have um, an update about that. Well, if, you, if you'll excuse me, I have lost my visual and I think I'm gonna have to go out and come back in. Okay. Um, I have a friend who said she had a, was interested in a position on the board and she said she had applied online. Great. So I'll, I will double check with her because that was a few days ago. So Thanks. Sheila, I would recommend you wait until uh, after this meeting and let's see if I hear back from the city clerk because perhaps she did and I just don't have the update. Okay, fine. Thank you. So I'll just give you guys an update. I, I, I It's my intention to, um, to not renew uh, my uh, my commitment to this board, but I'm um, uh, very seriously considering a position on the Friends Board. So I'm going to work with uh, Michelle. I don't know quite the details or how that, when, when that comes up, but that's my intention right now. There are, um, let me unmute.
Okay. There are seven positions on the Friends Board that are available in 2021, and uh, Ruth Waka is sort of managing that um, process. That board does not have the geographic restrictions that this board does, and I did mention that to the person from Lyons, um, but she was really interested in something else, so I've connected her. I mentioned the AAC to her, Sarah, just so you know. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, she had some other thoughts in mind. So that's that's what I know. And great, uh, Michelle, we'd love to have you on the Friends Board as well. So other uh, comments, questions? Um, I am thinking um, seriously of uh, <laughs> resigning as president, but would be very interested in um, the uh, AAC board. You will see later on our agenda, that is something we need to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> so with your permission, I'll keep an eye on my email and uh, get back with you about the application update, um, if that's okay. Any other input about board membership or positions for 2021? Okay. Um, Moving on to reopening, Michelle. Well, as of if you are following the trends and certainly some of the warnings and messages coming out of the state uh, Department of Public Health, et cetera, uh, we're not going in the right direction. So Longmont Senior Center will not be opening uh, December 1st and um, we're going to continue to sort of move on a month to month basis. Uh, and we are making last minute adjustments in our winter go to reflect that. Meals on Wheels is also not reopening. Uh, the restrictions on restaurants and dining has um, also uh, been changing and getting more restrictive. So uh, our staff is looking at doing another round of reaching out to folks who are not connected uh, technologically. We are going through our lists of folks and trying to catch back up with people. Um, so we, we, we will not be reopening this year. Or any other old business to discuss? Sarah, you're on mute. Sarah, did were, did you have something that you wanted to share? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I muted myself because the phone was ringing. So. Oh. Anyway, um, but to go back a bit to the positions for 2021, may I ask when that, uh, those elections will take place? Are you talking about the president and secretary, Sarah? Yeah. So those usually take place in January when we have our new board members. Um, <laughs> You'll notice we kind of went through that a little quickly, but um, Michelle, you are still on the TRG through March. Yeah, that's a funny way it doesn't sync, but yes. Um, so I think that if you had something happening January, February, or March, we'd ask you to report somehow okay. to me or to the board about okay. that. Okay. And then I will follow up with Kathy Fedler about okay what happens after March. Um, okay. So I will do that. The AAC position is uh, Sarah's been that uh, represent representative for you all. Um, Sarah, I don't know what your term is on that, but you and I are going to have to probably follow up with Lindsay or somebody about that. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't remember either when that term ends, but Okay. Well, 
I think that if you, Sarah, if you continue in that role, um, then we, in your role and your term with the AAC, which you can do as long as you live in Boulder County, um, or if you have to resign and, or if Lindsay just reopens the Longmont Advisory Board role, um, I will email her and, and copy you on that, Sarah, so we both get kind of what, what's happening there. My recollection is, because I've been through this once before, is that I uh, have to resign, or, well, you have to indicate that the, the board position uh, is open, and then if I want to continue on AAC, I have to reapply and be um, reappointed as a, uh, a member at large. Right, or if you move representing your new community or however that unfolds. Okay. Yeah. Um, then Jack, I don't know about the sustainability, um, where you want to go with that. Janine had been our alternate, but do you need to officially resign or are you going to stick with the sustainability committee? What are you thinking about that, Jack? You're on mute. Jack, you're muted. Still no. muted. Let's try it now. There you are. Okay. Um, I might apply to the sustainability board. I'm not sure yet. I have a couple of days to think about it, but that's about it, Michelle. All right. Thanks, Jack. And then uh susan if you want to continue on the as the liaison to the friends I'm you fine with that you would do that okay and then art if you are interested in continuing to kind of be that latino coalition connection that is fine i will continue okay and then the other note is that janine would be interested in the aac position depending on how that all shakes out is that right janine Yes. Um, and so we'd be looking for a president and a secretary in 2021. We don't need to make those decisions today, but um, by, by December or January at the latest, we probably need to, to have that figured out. Um, any questions, concerns, comments about this? Guess that wraps that up, Janine. You're on mute, Janine. Pardon? There you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, under new business, uh, T Care. So I'm uh, very excited about this. Uh, T Care is a program evidence-based program came out of the University of Wisconsin. The state of California has really adopted T-Care um, as a platform for case management for people who are caregivers of older adults. And the evidence-based piece is really tied to reducing or um, eliminating a caregiver's a dip, a use of Medicaid to pay for long-term care. So the idea is uh, by providing case management for caregivers who are caring for an older adult, you can reduce the use of Medicaid dollars for long-term care. So that's the, the evidence-based piece of that. So Boulder County Aging Services, the Area Agency on Aging, received uh, several free licenses for the T-Care program, and there's several air agencies on aging in Colorado who will also be going with a T-Care approach for caregivers. Um, there is an assessment that the caregiver completes, and then they are provided with a case manager. Um, 
Brandy Queen and Melissa Lucino on our team will be getting free licenses and will be participating in um, the uh, program along with the Boulder County Air Agency on Aging staff. Um, as most of you know, uh, Senior Services isn't, hasn't really been involved in um, evidence-based programs to this degree. So we're actually very excited to have the data to really demonstrate what are the services, the education, the support that really make a difference for uh, family caregivers. So this is not for paid caregivers. This is for family, friends, non-paid caregivers, this program. So um, we're excited to, to get involved, to be a part of the data uh, collection and see the results. For me personally, um, I am hoping that we get some other evidence <laughs> Based data besides the fact we've reduced Medicaid expenditures, but um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll unfold that, I guess, as our data comes in. So very excited to do this in partnership. So yeah, questions, Michelle. Yeah, um, so let me just like from a 30,000 foot level right. um, understand. So the idea is if they spend money to support caregivers, ultimately it enables um, seniors or, or older adults to live independently for longer, right? Is that kind of? No, no I wouldn't go quite there. So if okay. you, um, you take, the caregivers would take this assessment and they determine kind of a risk level. Okay. And then they are provided with case management. And in Longmont, that would be Brandy or Melissa okay. providing case management to those caregivers who hit that threshold. Um, and the evidence-based piece is that they are not using Medicaid for long-term care, i.e. they're not putting their family member or their friend they're caring for into a long-term care facility, which is very okay. expensive. Yeah. So by hooking those caregivers up with other resources, Okay. in-home services, education, emotional support, case management, by surrounding the caregiver right. with those kinds of services, the hope is that they can continue to provide that level of care without putting that person into a care facility. Okay, got it. So it's really supporting the caregiver and, okay. It's I'm really focused on the caregiver. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yes, Prudence. So, um, reduction in Medicaid dollars, okay. I guess my question is, is why would a care, I wonder if they've answered the question, why would a caregiver not want to be paid through the state to give care, but would do this freely um, in order, I mean, I just don't understand that. So the caregiver, it, it, there are there are some programs where family caregivers get paid by right. Medicaid, um, and to keep that person at home. This is really about placement in long-term care facilities. It's delaying or eliminating families from placing a loved one in a long-term care facility, which is the highest expense for Medicaid. Well, Michelle, how does this fit with the home and community-based services program? Right. It, 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 it actually will, I hope, increase the use of in-home supports. So using Medicaid to pay a family member to keep that person at home, using other dollars, including our personal care dollars through the county and through the friends, uh, to help people stay at home. So hopefully that's where the dollars are going is into remaining um, at home. But the evidence-based piece, I just want to be clear, is about the reduction in long-term care placements. Um, Janine and then Sheila. And I want to circle back to Prudence because I'm not sure I answered her question fully. So Janine? Uh, my question is basically how many you faded out, Janine. How many clients are we looking at that this might be 
helpful right. for? So that's a great question, and I do not know the answer to that. What we have, our approach has been is um, we are serving a lot of people with our caregiver education programs now, with our caregiver support groups. We offer two. There are others in the community. Um, we are really hoping to reach those caregivers who um, perhaps have not already availed themselves of services. What we know and what we heard from caregivers in 2018 is they really didn't think that a senior center was a place for them to go for support in caregiving for an older person. So we recognize and we've been talking to Boulder County about the marketing we're going to have to do to reach those people. Um, we're doing this as a pilot and we'll see how that unfolds, but I do not have a numbers guess. But the assessment itself will limit the pool because you have to hit a certain threshold of risk to get into this program. Does not mean we're not gonna serve you in another way, but for this program, there is a threshold. Sheila, and then I wanna again, circle back to Prudence. So the, the Medicaid dollars being saved are on purely on long-term care, that somebody has to go into a nursing home. Exactly. And so the Medicare dollars will still be assigned as they are currently to a caregiver. Yeah, hopefully that through the state area agencies on aging, we gather enough data that we might be able to influence uh, how those Medicaid dollars are distributed at the state level. But um, right now, that um, that's the evidence piece. Clearly, California has done some things, and we'll be learning more about that. So it's to keep people at home if possible. As if long possible. As possible. Okay, yep. thank yep. you. Prudence, I, again, I just want to make sure I, I, I got to yeah, your question. I, I think that um, I, I just can't, I, I'm going to look at California's numbers yeah. because it just doesn't make sense to me that you as a caregiver are getting paid and you're getting paid to take care of your loved one. Suddenly, you're not going to get paid. Well, we don't know that. You, okay. you, we don't know that. Yeah. Okay. So it's really about placement in a long-term care facility. Right. right. And there are so many caregivers who are providing care who are not in that program where they get a... Okay. Uh, They're not in, in home support services. With correct. Right. Right. It, yeah. Okay. I understand that. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Art, Art and then Sarah. And my understanding then that this really does not, is not... Uh, primarily for those individuals who are already caregivers and are getting paid. It's more for those individuals that need the assistance but are not getting any of the services. Am I correct on that? Well, let me, let me just say back up a little bit. So there are caregivers through home care agencies, et cetera, who families and individuals pay to come in and help with care. There is a specific program where a family member can get paid through Medicaid to take care of someone. Right. Um, that those, those programs will continue, but someone who makes their career, who makes their primary employment as a paid caregiver is not who this program is for. And if someone is not receiving care but needs it, then we just go ahead and refer them to to Melissa or or. or oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Those re yeah, those referrals will continue. This okay. program is really focused on family caregivers. So Correct. Sarah and then Marcia. Yeah, Sarah. I guess my question is: Does the person? Uh, who is receiving care have to be Medicaid eligible? Do they have to apply for uh, long-term care under Medicaid? So, you know, as with most situations, um, people start out not eligible for Medicaid. Um, so 
I'm caring for my mom, she has assets, there's no way she's Medicaid eligible. And we often hear about families having to spend down in order to become Medicaid eligible so they can then place someone in a nursing home. Um, so hopefully um, we might interrupt that cycle to some degree, right? And really help caregivers utilize all the resources that they have perhaps in a more meaningful and, and lengthy way. Did that answer your question? So the family would, <clears throat> I guess my question is um, coming out of my concern that so many people who are family caregivers or friends taking for care of a friend who um, you know, don't know anything at all about services and they think, well, we just got to wait until you know, we spend the person's assets to a point where they can be eligible for Medicaid. And I'm not sure how they're going to find out. Uh, this is uh, like before, if you went in and you um, applied for social services help, and it's clear you probably to a point where you need long-term care, they make an eligibility determination. Yeah, Are you I, for long-term care, that i.e. nursing facility? I, and then they send you to somebody to be assessed for HCBS services. Right. And so is this totally separate? Um, well, this is focused on the caregiver, not on the person who needs the care and is doing the eligibility. So, so when we are doing case management for the caregiver, there's going to be an array of resources that we're going to be talking with that caregiver about, including the information about HCBS and long-term care and Medicaid. I mean, that is a resource, right? And some people are eligible right now for that without having to spend down. So that is one resource in an array of resources that we will be supporting the caregiver with. Yep. Okay, Marsha, and then back to Prudence. Yeah, so just to see if I'm and the right idea. Um, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that this is a little bit analogous to um, the Homeless Services Coordinated Entry Program, where it seeks oh. to, to connect people with services that they may not have known about. And the objective is to see whether that delays putting people in full-time Medicaid care. Correct. The idea? Pr pretty, pretty good analogy. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thanks. Prudence. Thank you for that. That's all. Okay, so we know that the one um, evidence is reduction in Medicaid dollars. Right. Do, we, do they have any measurement of both the person, the caregiver satisfaction, right. as well as the person receiving care's satisfaction with the services that were developed under this program? So there, the data on that, I haven't seen the analysis of, and I can, I'm pretty confident it is focused on the caregiver, not the care recipient. I'll be curious to know more about that. Um, and the other piece that we have a lot of questions about is how culturally relevant is the assessment tool um, because we want Melissa to work with our uh, Spanish preferred uh, clients and families. And so we are really pushing them on an, an assessment tool that's culturally relevant. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're working a couple different things, Prudence, and, and we're digging in to some of that other data. The primary evidence-based piece is the, the Medicaid dollars piece, which is not the whole picture, obviously. I don't feel like it is. And so um, 
we'll we'll see how this shakes out and and um and we want the culturally relevant component um there are some caregiver programs nationally that have not just translated their material into spanish they've actually done a deeper dive and made the programs more culturally relevant sarah yeah <clears throat> again referring to i i've been frustrated for years at my inability to convince friends that I know are caregivers and would be eligible for and benefit from lots of services to think they need them. And <clears throat> so they don't go to the senior resource specialist. They just think, you know, I, I can handle this myself. Right. Um, and it's only when the, the money gets tight that they start thinking, maybe I better find out what's available. So it seems to me the success of this project is gonna depend a lot on outreach. Absolutely. And, and a different kind of marketing approach, which we talked about in our meeting last week. Um, when we reached caregivers the most is when we use Nextdoor as our platform. Not the go, not the web, not, it was through Nextdoor that we reached caregivers. And so we really have to think about that um, outreach and what that's gonna look like. I totally agree with you. It, um, it will look a little different than perhaps how else we've done some of our, our outreach efforts. Because a caregiver of an older person can be a 22 year old college student, a granddaughter. It could be me. Uh, a full-time working 61-year-old. I think how old I am now, 61. Um, so I think we have to think about that and what is happening in their lives and who they are and where they are. Um, so it will be it will be a learning. Um, I'm I'm excited for what we learn from this. Um, and the other exciting thing for me is that the county aging services and us, uh, Lawnmon, we're really looking at the resources we put into caregiver programs and how to do that more efficiently and more effectively, which I'm, I, I really am excited about taking a look at all of our resources a little differently. So right now, for those of you who don't know this, um, the county aging services has two respite programs. One, a caregiver can apply and get up to $500 to use uh, to give themselves respite from their caregiving role. And then there is a respite care volunteer program where volunteers can come into the home and stay with the care recipient while the caregiver gets a break. So you might wanna go bird watching at 5 a.m., you might wanna go out to lunch with friends, whatever it is. So we hope to kind of reel those programs and some of the others that are going on so we have that, a better understanding of who's doing what, what's available, um, and really look at the resources, the support, um, and the education from a kind of that 30,000 foot level. You know, what all is available and how do we, how do we market it and make it um, more usable for our caregivers? Any other questions? More to come. I think, you know, you should, Next year, you should be saying, Michelle, if I don't bring it forward, what's the data saying? What's the data saying? I'm serious, you know, um, what are we learning? So that's T-Care, <laughs> that's what it's called. You can uh, check out California or the University of Wisconsin um, because that, that's where it emerged was uh, a professor and team in, in Wisconsin. Yeah, Michelle. Do you have resource, like, what are you doing with the data? Are, do you have some place you're sending it and they're doing the analysis and spitting it back out or you right. guys aren't being left to kind of make sense of it yourselves, right? Right, so there is some algorithms within the T-Care uh, software package that will do okay. a lot of that. Okay. Um, and then Carol Cross from Boulder County Air Agency on Aging is kind of our data guru. As many of you know, that is not my forte. 
Um, and so between Carol Cross and Brandy, who loves data, um, I think we'll, we'll be able to start to put together a picture. Okay. Yeah, not, I'm not good at data. I, sorry, <laughs> it's just. You're good at so many other things. I don't know. Data <laughs> is really important. And then I, I have not, uh, I've not been the best uh, leader in that way. So I'm excited for this, so. That's great. other questions at all before we move on to any other new business no all right uh, next on the agenda is reports um, Michelle do you have any reports to share with us about <laughs> supervision um so a couple of things uh i got calls from several people including marcia about making sure older adults had a way to vote and so the longmont housing authority um properties uh there is some really nice community there and folks were taking care of each other making sure people got to to do their ballots got turned in or mailed or whatever. We put out information about free rides that were being offered. And so we, we, uh, we did not get any calls this year, uh, which is pretty unusual from older people saying, I need to go vote. Um, I think that the folks were attending to one another and making that happen. So I want to say thanks. Thanks to Marsha and to others. We, we kept pushing the word out and um, we really didn't, didn't get any calls about it. And, it. and it looks like people showed up to vote. So uh, we'll see what those results are, right? In the Awareness has been so heightened, you yeah. know, that it's just like people are, you know, it, it's kind of been magical. That's great. And people are taking care of people, which exactly. is really great. Exactly. So that was exciting. Um, the Longmont Housing Authority work uh, continues to uh, take up the vast amount of my time um, with the, uh, I am still managing the community managers. Um, we are interviewing today, tomorrow and Friday for a regional asset manager as well as two community managers. So once we get that regional asset manager on board, my role will diminish. Um, and that is probably a really good thing uh, for a variety of reasons. So um, I remain absolutely um, in support of what city council and Harold and others have done in terms of stepping in in supporting Longmont Housing Authority. My staff um, have done an amazing job. We are, as a team, really supporting the remodel at Aspen Meadows Apartments. We are moving people out of Aspen Meadows and into a local hotel <clears throat> while those units get refurbished and moving folks back. Um, what uh, what has transpired to be the best option is Michelle works with tenant so and so Amy works with tenant a different tenant and each of us are doing sort of a hands on approach to meeting that person helping them get what they need to the hotel and then reverse mm -hmm. uh, they will start moving back in next week so we're uh, pretty excited about that um, and that has really been um a huge team effort and very hands-on and we're learning a lot about what people are living with and what supports and resources they might need in across the properties uh, brandy continues to provide supervision and support at the suites which is the longmont housing authority property that is permanent supportive housing primarily for people transitioning out of homelessness but with other uh, also others who have been housing challenged. So Brandy's been involved down there um, and it has really been an incredible learning experience and I believe we have been well placed as a team to do advocacy on behalf of older adults. And so um, 
while it has been an um, unbelievable amount of work, um, it's been good work and um, I think we were in the right place to, to do that. So that's been happening. Um, we have staff still doing some administrative support at LHA. Our custodial staff are still doing service uh, custodial work at other recreation facilities while we are closed. And Megan and Larry are really holding down the fort in terms of programming. So um, everyone is very, very busy. Um, and all of us want to be opened and all of us want our customers back in the building. Um, but that's not gonna happen anytime soon. But um, believe me, your senior services staff uh, are really amazing and doing fabulous work. And that is my report. And we are well, we also really glad to have some volunteers back. Thank you, Janine, for coming back and doing some of that resource work. We are now trying to figure out how we're going to do income tax. Um, we are kind of up against what AARP nationally is saying to their income tax volunteers. So we're trying to work that out um, and making sure we can, we can do that. So that's kind of where we are. Any comments or questions? Okay. Oh, Susan. So does it look like income tax will make it back in the spring? Yeah, so AARP volunteers came and got all of their laptops uh, that we, we store for them. And the last word I heard, Susan, is it's going to be virtual. They will be providing assistance, but it's going to be virtual. We are hoping that AARP allows some window uh, because we definitely had people who needed to meet in person um, this last year. So we're waiting to find out what that window might be. Okay. Um, and, and obviously, it could be the kind of thing where we push the income tax deadline out to May or something. Uh, depends on our leadership at the federal level what happens with that. But um, we doubt though we'll be, we don't know. I shouldn't say we doubt. We're, we're concerned that they may push out what in-person interviews till perhaps March, which would be really tough if uh, to try and get everybody in, in in a month. So that's kind of where we are. Okay. Yes, Prudence. How many people come in person? To do income taxes? Mm -hmm. Do we know? <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, almost 200 in past years. And so for some folks, they don't have the uh, computer link um, and many of them have hearing difficulties and different reasons they really need that in person. So. We have offered to get face shields for the volunteers. We, we're trying to support that in you know, different ways. So if they meet in person, you can read lips. Um, the other, yeah, go ahead. Well, um, face shields really don't do anything. However, I just read yesterday that um, there are masks that are clear that were invented by a woman who was deaf and they are medical grade, um, it, which is it, very interesting because some of them are in medical grade, but these actually, she has medical grade and non-medical grade. If you have information you could send to me, that would be great. That yeah. would be great. Um, we also have the plexiglass we're using. So I know yesterday we had a, a meeting with a family, a couple people and our resource staff Everybody had masks, some people had face shields, plus we had the plexiglass in between. So, you know, folks are trying to do what they can do to minimize or, or reduce that risk. Um, we're also really ramping up our technology program. We're gonna be buying Chromebooks. We have a list of four people so far who responded to the last newsletter, folks who would be interested in um, getting technology um, and we're looking at Chromebooks um, and we would provide those to individuals. It would not be shared. They would, they, there'll be an application, they would get that. And we're also looking at making, um, 
Wi-Fi available in some of the very low income Longmont Housing Authority buildings. So kudos to the city of Longmont for um, that, that effort. So we're trying to work the technology angle and still allow for those in-person uh, needs as, as they are, arise. So it's kind of where we are. Art, you had a question, you're muted. Yes, Michelle, uh, at what, uh, when do we start, can the people start making uh, appointments, if you will, for that? Is that right after the first of the year? Or? So Larry, Larry is working with the AARP tax people right now, and there will be a write-up in the winter go. Usually we start making appointments about the third week of January. We don't know if we're making appointments for telephone appointments or what we're doing. Um, if it ends up going that route, then we will definitely make space in the building for the income tax volunteers to come here and use our phones to make those calls. Um, so we're, we're still trying to figure out what those details are going to be. Thank you. Yep. I think that's it for me, Janine. Okay. Uh, Marcia, a update from the city council. Um, yeah, there was no city council meeting last night, thankfully. Um, we had the forethought to pick election night as one of the nights that didn't need to have a city council meeting. Um, the uh, uh, outcomes of both the local and the state ballot measures, I'd like to point out, were uh, by and large very favorable to the city. Um, so the two, the, the two city uh, ballot questions both passed. And um, I'm, I'm still not sure about some of, some of the ballot measures uh, at the state level, but uh, it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, so other, you know, other than that, I don't really um, have much news. Does anybody have any questions? No questions, no questions at all. all right. Right. Uh, Sarah, do you have anything to report for Ariel on Eugene? Yes, Janine, your sound is sort of garbled as I'm getting it. I don't I'm know. just not sure what. Uh, I'm going to go out well coming in again. again. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure. I have no report for the Area Aging Council because we are not meeting in November. So there's nothing that I have new since the last report. Okay, is that any better at all? Yes. Much better. All right, now I'm going to put the video on and hopefully things will stay. Uh, Sarah, I'm sorry, please continue. I, I'm, my report is that I have no report because November is a month when the AAC does not meet. Okay. Uh, Susan, anything on friends? Uh, we did meet. Uh, they're trying to finalize transfer of funds between the old bank and our new bank. 
finances are healthy, so they're able to support senior services. Uh, the focus was on uh, putting out a, the donation letter, the pandemic 2020 version, so that should be arriving to people shortly for the annual campaign. And the big item is all the vacancies that they will have to fill on their board and how challenging it is when we don't see each other in the senior center to recruit people. But everybody's been charged with contacting friends who may be interested in filling the board positions. Your audio is gone. Okay, it's there, it's back. <laughs> I don't know what to do at this point. Um, does anyone have any other comment or question at all? I just want to remind everybody the deadline for applications is five o'clock Friday. Um, I just checked my email, I haven't received anything, but I will send an email update out to you all when I uh, when I get that information so you kind of know where we are in terms of board uh, applicants. I will tell you that um, as always we do some special outreach and we have reached out to some of our Latino community members, Veronica and I, and so um, uh, we we have contacted three folks specifically and hoping one of them at least says yes and um, we're doing some other you know individual one-on-one -on -one invitations so um, hopefully um, we uh, we can keep that moving forward I do have two people that I'm going to do door knocking on today thank you so. <laughs> Okay. Um, Michelle, do you have anything to report for TRG? I have nothing to report for TRG. And Art, anything on the Boulder County Latino Coalition? The only thing I have to report on that is uh, Pete Salas did send out a, a text to all the people that he is, uh, that he writes to or, or texts to and inform them about the position, uh, positions also. So I have to report on that. Okay. Uh, Longmont Economic Development Partnership. I have nothing to report. I will be uh, sending them another email reminding them uh, that I am interested at least in attending their quarterly meetings. I know they are going through some administrative transition. I don't know if uh, that's their reasoning, but I will be uh, contacting them again, reminding them that we aren't receiving notification of their uh, Zoom meetings and that I would like to be uh, involved in those. Uh, Jack, do you have anything to report on sustainability? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The sustainability meeting took place on the 28th of October at 5.15, it was Zoomed. They mentioned that some folks really aren't aware, but the Platte River Power Authority is the source for electricity for the city of Longmont. There was a guest speaker from uh, Platte River Power Authority, uh, Trista Fugate. She talked about the resources plan for the new generating plant. They talked about a five-year action plan the goal by 2030 is to have no carbon used at the facilities that produce electricity. 
Um, they talked about a problem with battery um, storage for wind and other energy. Uh, I, I asked if they had reached out to the German government, which I know has had pretty much excellent success in storing their power, especially from power from uh, solar energy. They've done a good job, better than we have, in increasing their battery capacities. The city of Longmont, the council, is going to be meeting on um, the 17th of November to talk about climate action. They talked about recycling to decrease CO2 in our atmosphere. They talked about trash programs, composting, and dumpster use for debris. And there was some talk about how are they going to use the, they, we do have a tax, a sustainability tax on our taxes here in the city of Longmont and for Boulder County and how that tax revenues were supposed to be used for staff and other things. Now they did not send out a, the minutes for that particular meeting, but it's forthcoming. So I should have it by next meeting and I'll be happy to distribute to the group. That's about it. Um, I think the, the census is complete. Is there anything in addition to that, Sarah, that you've heard? No, no additional. Okay. Uh, closing statements. Uh, Julie, you are invited to be heard or questioned. <clears throat> Have nothing. None. Okay. Jack. Yeah. Uh, may I say something about uh, COVID? There is two things that I've read recently from CDC and Mayo and John Hopkins that might be helpful to the group. Do you mind if I mention it? Oh, please. Okay. What they were saying is some of the reservoirs for the uh, COVID virus is in our nasal passages, in our sinuses, and also in our oral cavity. So what I've been using is something called a neti pot. And I use this rinse. It's a uh, saline rinse. And I also mix it with eight ounces of uh, water, preferably uh, distilled water, and also to put in about a half a teaspoon of betadine. You could put it in the microwave, but no more than about 20 seconds and let it cool down. Mix it up again and put it in each nostril. And that's been very effective against the coronavirus in your sinuses. And you could also use one of these. It comes in a, a package. You could use that in each nostril, four ounces and for each nostril. The other thing they found out that is closer to my heart is you could use oral rinses that have alcohol in them only, not the ones that are non-alcohol. And that seems to be able to kill some of the COVID-19 viruses as well. And the, I won't say bad thing, but you know, COVID is gonna be with us for a while, unfortunately. And the more we can do, keep the reservoir of viruses within our bodies, the safer we'll be. Although the alcohol and the oral rinse does seem to slightly affect the uh, enzyme processes when we digest our food, but I'd rather be safer from the uh, COVID than worrying about my digestive processes. So anyway, I just hope that's helpful and uh, I use it personally. So I put it up to you folks to use it for yourselves or neighbors or friends. And I think it is helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I also use the, the Neil Med system. I'm a plastic bottle fan myself. Good. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it is good stuff. I never thought you could put betadine in it, though. That's new for me. No, I, I, I'm, unfortunately, unfortunately, I had a, a, a recent uh, uh, ENT meeting with a physician, and he suggested that, and I looked it up, and it seems to be a good product to use. It's been used for years. I remember when I was in the service, they used to use it as uh, debridement for, for wounds. And it's uh, been found to be safe to use for the nasal sinuses. And uh, I'm using it. Yeah, and that's it's, amazing. I knew it as a topical. Yeah. Huh. Um, it's Good stuff. So we all learned something. Thank you, Jack. It, um, if anybody has been to the dentist um, during this time, and I've been... I think two or three times. Um, what they have you do is they have you rinse your mouth for 20 seconds with hydrogen peroxide. And the first time I had to do it, I asked. I said, why am I doing this? Um, and they said, it kills, it's for their protection. So if I have COVID-19 in my, you know, in my oral cavity, which is one of the ways you can get it, it'll wipe it out. So that's another thing that they, the dentists are using it. So they have, you know, AMA has really, the ADA has really tested it. Well, that's why some of the toothpaste have uh, peroxide in it as well. And that's been an old thing for ages. So you can alternate and use both. Right. You've got to protect yourself and anything that one could use, I think is important. And the peroxide is another good one. And that's good for wounds too, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Oh, no, you're welcome. So um, I'm sure most of you are aware of the fact that the University of Colorado is doing a vaccine study. Um, actually in Loveland, you have to drive to uh, Loveland. Uh, I am currently a part of that study. Uh, and if anybody is interested in participating, um, it's pretty intense. It does involve two years, uh, although you can stop at any particular point in time if you feel a need to do that. Uh, I do have uh, a website, and if anyone is interested, just uh, let me know, and I will be happy to share that website with you. Um, and uh, as I said, it is the Oxford vaccine that mm -hmm. is currently being studied. So, yes, Jack. I've got something important. If people are allergic to iodine, betadine isn't a thing to use. <laughs> right. Um, are there any other closing statements or any other things that we need to address on our agenda this morning? Yes, I have a question. Uh, Michelle, I know that the deadline for the senior board is Friday. For the friends board, is that the same time also? No, if someone was interested in the friends board, if they could get a hold of me um, in the next two or three weeks, that would be ideal. And then on November um, 24th, the friends will be talking about um, names of interested persons. And then through the month of December, we'll be following back up with folks. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, I should clarify, since some people talked about other boards that they might be interested in, the, the Friday deadline is for all the boards that have to be interviewed and approved by the city council. Thank you, Marsha. I should have said something about broader than the senior center. So I assume that those interviews are gonna take place via Zoom, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, Prudence? Yes, one more thing about COVID-19. Colorado has an app called um, CO Notification Exposure. You can download it either in your Apple or your Android. It's in the, place, in the Google Play Store. And what it does is that it informs you whether you've been in contact with someone who's positive. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I thank you all very much for your participation this morning. Um, please stay well. And uh, can I hear a motion uh, for the meeting to be adjourned? I so move. I second it. That was Jack and Michelle. Uh, okay. It was Jack Susan. and Susan. Oh, Susan. I'm sorry, Susan. That's okay. All right. Everyone, All right. Take care. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.